greeting to everyone good evening good evening how are you all good evening to everybody good evening we were celebrating your birthday which was in january yes so we are now live on youtube we'll be professionals today welcome you all to the wofeps public lecture series number 2 we have professor alp nimaglu the president of the world federation of association of pediatric surgeons welcome we have professor mohammed salim who represents pakistan australasia welcome professor salim we have pepe online professor joy boa ochwa who is very well known are you there with us okay so we will begin the series and professor ochwa will tell us about tracheoesophageal fistula well to understand the tracheoesophageal fistula it is absolutely necessary to understand the embryology on the fourth week of the neonate appears under the esophageal arch one boot that is the four good the intestinal four good this intestinal four good begins to split in two bots one is the respiratory tract and the other one will be the esophagus they will begin to grow and will be separated by an endodermal tracheoesophageal wall. Normally, everything goes normal. Everything goes normal. And then we will have the trachea with the lungs and also the esophagus. But if this tracheoesophageal between the trachea and the esophagus is an endodermal wall. If this wall has a failure and goes a little bit dorsal, then he cuts the esophagus tube and we have the esophageal atresia. Normally, this esophageal atresia, in 90% of cases, is a pouch upside, and the esophagus that comes from the stomach and has a link, a tube, with the trachea. That is the tracheoesophageal fistula. Only very, very, very seldom then can the, can the tracheoesophageal fistula in 3% of the cases can be from the upper part and the other part is bl bl blamed. Then it is another possibility that both of them they have a tracheoesophageal fistula. The symptoms are very easy because the stomach in the X-ray has not an air bubble, and also, and also we have. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well, but we can't see your video. If you want to switch on your video, you can do that. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you very well. Okay. Then I will put... Okay. Yes. Then, then we have the four kinds of tracheoesophageal fistula. One, a three, the esophageal atresia with a tracheoesophageal fistula from the esophagus 
that comes from the stomach. Then the tracheoesophageal fistula that comes from the upper pouch. Then the trache two tracheoesophageal fistulas. And that is very, very, very seldom. The diagnosis of the esophageal atresia, we know everybody, the child has to be operated in the first moment because has an esophageal atresia and also the tracheoesophageal fistula, and we have a lot of problems with uh, infections of the lung, and also we have that the upper part is full of saliva. Well, the treatment is the treatment is very easy. The treatment is until now the treatment was the treatment was uh, by thoracotomy, open thoracotomy. Then you get with posterior lateral thor right thoracotomy, and then you get to the esophagus, and you can see the fistula. You ligate the fistula, and then you try to make the anastomosis between the two esophageal pouch. If not, later you can do that with in intestine or the coming with the stomach upside. Today, today is another thing. Today can be done easily, not easily, but with difficulty, but by the specialist, it's very, it's a normal thing with minimal invasive surgery. And the results are very good. I think that today, today as a, in my time, that means almost 50 years ago, the mortality was very high. And today, the survival is 90% normally. Because this child, these children, they have also cardiac anomalies. And we have to treat both of them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. Boy Ochoa, that was a good description. So how will these babies present? Professor Salim, can you highlight that? Uh, if a baby after birth uh, is drooling with the saliva and he or she does not tolerate the feed every time it is uh, regurgitated or vomited out and along with the feed, there is a choking of the child, then we should suspect that it is a case of tracheoesophageal fistula with a, a tracheoesophageal atresia with maybe tracheoesophageal fistula. Such sort of the babies should, uh, as most of the time these babies are in the nursery, uh, a pediatrician should be well aware of this situation. If he suspects uh, like uh, tracheoesophageal fistula, he must consult pediatric surgeon or the refer the patient to a uh, facility where pediatric surgical facilities are available and along with the nurse nursery facilities. Uh, usually, we have seen that uh, uh, the patients are referred on the second or third day, but sometimes the pediatrician miss these patients, and the patient in Pakistan or third world countries, they are sometimes referred on late, uh, after six or seven days. They should try a, a, a general practitioner or a, a general doctor or a pediatrician. Uh, they should be aware of the situation, and they should uh, diagnose this situation by passing an NG tube. If it is not passed or it is uh, uh, curled up or it came out, out, out of the mouth, he should suspect that it may be a 80% case of tracheoesophageal fistula with esophageal atresia or uh, esophageal atresia with or without fistula. He, uh, uh, then he should uh, uh, pass an NG which should be radio opaque or a carefully passed uh, some radio opaque dye and ligated so that it may not be spilled out into the uh, trachea and then take X-ray, AP and lateral view. On the lateral view, he can clearly diagnose that this is a case of tracheoesophageal atresia with fistula and then he, it should must be referred to a proper setting where uh, neonatal uh, facilities, neonatology is well equipped and uh, is able to 
uh, manage this patient after um, uh, repair. As Boss uh, Alchua has highlighted, that it needs to be done by thoracotomy or minimal invasive. But these patients, they have to be managed very carefully in the nursery. Thank you so much. So for the layman, if there is drooling of saliva, there is frothing in the mouth, be aware of this condition and do not allow that baby to be fed till tracheoesophageal fistula is ruled out. Professor Alp, can you highlight what should be the transport uh, mechanism for such babies if it's born in a periphery or five hours away from a hospital? What should be the system in place, ideally? Thanks very much, uh, um, Prof. Sharma. So again, also thank you very much for setting this up uh, today. I um, really appreciate that. So neonates is a very special group of patients. Um, they, uh, they, they are different to certainly adults, and when we talk about from the medical point of view, but they're also even different to the normal children. Um, it's, a, it's a period where they've just made their transition from uh, being a fetus and becoming a little baby, a, a child. So a lot of things are changing already inside and uh, from the physiology point of view, and there's some anatomical changes also occur uh, to pre prepare them to the life as a neonate and a, and a child uh, afterwards. A couple of things that uh, um, very easily can go wrong with the small babies is they get cold very easily. So it's also so-called hypothermia. They uh, also... Um, De rely on having being fed so uh, if they are not fed uh, they can drop their blood sugar very quickly and can you imagine a baby who does not have a food pipe this is a federal atresia that we're talking and we don't have a food pipe that means we're not able to feed the baby and if you want to feed the baby it just vomits the feet and it doesn't really go into the stomach so they can have uh, issues with their uh, blood sugar as well and uh, and the condition is such that, as we have uh, also mentioned, there's a lot of saliva that's collecting, unable to swallow that saliva, and that can go into the lungs as well and can create issues with uh, lung infection or airway problems and so on. So, so these are the sort of main areas that one needs to make sure that uh, the baby is not cold, um, is being fed in intravenously, ideally, uh, if the facility is available, put up a drip and, and give some uh, fluids and uh, and energy, as well as uh, making sure that the airway is protected, um, and uh, and and in some cases, and further treatment like intubation and ventilation, the respiratory treatment may also be needed. So it's a it's a specialized uh, transport that is required ideally. And as uh, Prof. Salim also mentioned, the examination of the baby is so important when the baby is, is born. So every every baby, when they're born, they need to have a check uh, for a variety of potential uh, diseases or, uh, or, or congenital abnormalities that they may have. And this is one of them. This is a visual atresia or born without the food pipe uh, in being intact is one of those. And when it's picked up, then all the uh, immediate uh, treatment modalities need to start and, and a specialized uh, transport, which, which I very briefly mentioned here, uh, needs, to, needs to take place. Um, I'm sure you, you'll probably discuss uh, where it is best to treat these patients as well. Um, and again, uh, um, my colleagues also must uh, join me um, in support to me with the with the explanation of uh, the the treatment where it takes place, but it is a condition of uh, pediatric surgery. Uh, it is one of the index pediatric surgical conditions, as we say, and the treatment requires uh, a specialist in the field of pediatric surgery to uh, initiate surgical treatment. It's uh, it's a complex procedure. Um, yesterday we also mentioned uh, how we work as a team with our colleagues from nursing and also in aesthetics and intensive care unit. And this is one of those conditions where um, multiple team members need to work uh, together. I'll, I'll leave it here, um, Shilpa, and if there's anything further, I'm, I'm happy to contribute, of course.
So uh, thank you for telling us how the baby is supposed to be transported in ideal circumstances, but the world is not ideal. So we may not get the ambulance support. We may not get a doctor or a nurse to accompany the patient. So in setups like developing countries where there's only the parents who can take care of the child, we can tell them that, yes, you can get the trip put and they should be told with a mark that this is the amount of fluid that has to go in this duration, not more than that. The temperature can be taken care of and then remains the suction part that is to protect the airway. So in our country, we have a small equipment known as mucus sucker. So we teach the parents that you can keep sucking out the saliva which gets collected in the mouth. Ideally, and otherwise they can buy a manual suction machine, but here there is no time to waste. If they can hire a manual suction machine, it's fine. That also costs a lot of money, but mucus sucker is the one that they usually use for the transport. How is the condition in uh, America, Professor Ochoa? How do you manage? In America, in America, in America is very, it, they are pediatric surgery clinic all over all over mm -hmm. the the state and you get the children the new words very 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 early but america uh, has done already with the american america has first has the american pediatric surgical association and also the section of pediatric surgery inside the international pediatric association and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Also, the pediatricians in America are very aware with the saliva of the children. Then they put, then they put a tube, and then they need they know that they don't go down. And then they immediately they make it by helicopter or by by ambulance to the next hospital. But they are, in America they. Only, only in some parts of America, uh, a hospital is 150k, k, but that is one hour, that, that is two hours or three hours away. And the doctors are very aware because the pediatric surgeons in America, they have done a lot of work uh, implying the pediatrician in the pediatric surgery. And in America is no problem with this. In the South big, America, in yeah. South Amer in South America, it's a big problem mm -hmm. because because first, uh, almost all the pediatric surgeons in South America are more private than in clinics, and the clinics are in the only in the big cities, and they are very poor, and to bring the children. It's very difficult. Buenos Aires and so on is easy. And the doctors they don't they they know it. But the doctors they don't want to go to the to some parts of the of the countries because it's completely isolated, isolated and it's very difficult. So when the doctors do the delivery in our part of the world, then it's fine, but around 60% of the deliveries may be done by midwives in the villages, home deliveries. Those are the ones that have problems with no periphery, no uh, hospital care nearby. Uh, thank you so much for that. So yesterday we talked about anorectal malformation. So in 10% of the cases, the tracheoesophageal fistula may be associated with other anomalies, especially the anorectal malformation. So if there is a drooling of saliva, always turn the baby around and see whether there is a normal anal opening or not. With that, we move to the next life-threatening condition in the newborn that is known as congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So, Professor Salim, how will these patients present? Uh, after birth, it, it depends upon it uh, how much severe is the anomaly. If the pa a child has a respiratory distress, he, it is uh, difficult for him to take the breath and he is uh, struggling for uh, breath and there is a uh, recession of the ribs and uh, 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 his uh, oxygen is not... Uh, he is not properly oxygenated, then it should be suspected there is some anomaly with the respiratory system, especially in the lower part of the chest by uh, with the diaphragm. In these cases, these patients should immediately be uh, shifted to the pediatric, uh, uh, pediatric setup 
where uh, nursery is available. But sometimes these patients, as you have highlighted uh, in uh, our part of the world, the patients are, there are more than 50% are home deliveries are in the uh, lower small clinic deliveries, then it is uh, difficult for them to uh, suspect these cases because they are usually not aware of this, uh, uh, this anomaly. Uh, we should have to create awareness at all the levels in the general community, at the level of uh, general practitioners, at the level of pediatricians, that the neonatal, as uh, you have highlighted, that the patient should be examined properly at birth. From uh, One of our teachers, Professor Abdurrahmi, says, from head to toe. And if he has some difficulty, he must suspect a respiratory uh, difficulty in taking respiration. He must suspect there is something wrong with the respiratory system, and it may be congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Uh, pediatricians are usually aware of this condition. They do suspect these things, and they start resuscitation. And uh, these patients should be uh, uh, provided with well uh, oxygen uh, support and uh, as uh, Professor Elf highlighted, their IV line should be maintained and proper uh, uh, hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, hypothermia. These are the main killer of these patients. They should be looked up. Meanwhile, the patient should be sent to a facility where pediatric surgeon is available. Uh, in the uh, new needs, in there is a no competition uh, between the any other surgeon and pediatric surgeon. New needs are usually referred to the pediatric surgeons, and uh, so it should be referred to the pediatric surgical setting. And uh, then it, uh, after resuscitation, correcting all hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, hypovolemia, everything should be corrected. And uh, oxygen support should be provided. Sometimes these patients may need ventilation. But it is very, very tricky in these cases to ventilate these uh, childs. Uh, so, yeah. Carry on, uh, please. Uh, very, very uh, uh, tricky to ventilate as uh, there is a defect and on the one side, uh, stomach and uh, intestine, major part of the intestine is sometimes the liver and spleen also gone up. Then uh, uh, it is a uh, difficult to maintain them on, uh, above 90% oxygen level, saturation of oxygen level. It depends if the patient present within the six hours, then it is has a uh, uh, not a good prognosis. If present within 24 hours, then somewhat good prognosis. And if present late, then uh, have a good more than 90% prognosis in case of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. As Professor Basachwa told us that TAF patients, there is a recovery rate of 90%, but a diaphragmatic hernia is still a challenge. It may be better in case of uh, developed countries like America, Britain, or Europe. But in our part of the country, uh, usually the patients, uh, they are referred late or suspected late. They usually come who have a, a difficulty in respiration before six hours. Only those patients which are in uh, uh, big cities like Delhi, uh, Delhi or Lahore or Karachi or Bombay or Madras, they reach within time and they, can, uh, they, they, and they take the uh, opportunity of the facility to be managed. These patients are, nowadays it is said that they are not an emergency, it is a pediatric emergency, not surgical emergency. First, make the patient fit, correct the dosage, correct uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, make the saturation up, uh, uh, and make the patient stable, then proceed for operation. Uh, before the operation, we should make the, our diagnosis uh, by getting the x-ray or CT if needed and allow, uh, the patient allows you or uh, uh, if the patient presented late, you can get also the barium swallow or CT scan with the contrast that will help you to diagnose the case. Along with this, uh, certain uh, blood investigations are needed. Blood complete should be done. Uh, ABGs are mandatory, and these are the main uh, help for the, uh, managing these patients uh, before operations. After making the patient fit for uh, surgery, the patient, uh, it should be provided, uh, uh, proceeded for the operations. Uh, so for the layman, we say that if there is a blue baby with increased respiratory rate and a scaphoid abdomen, that is a pinched down abdomen, then think of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So to transport such babies, Professor Alp, what would you recommend? Do they need to be intubated? So should a tube be put into the stomach, a naso naso nasogastric tube or an orogastric tube before transport? Uh, 
if there is no ambulance facility? So I think um, as we have discussed with the uh, um, first topic, that general um, care of the neonate still applies to a baby that's uh, born and diagnosed or suspected with uh, congenital diaphragmatic hernia as well. Um, one of the things Prof. Salim mentioned that this is not a surgical emergency, but it is a pediatric emergency. Uh, perhaps uh, I can ask uh, Prof. Boyx Ocha also to say a few words about WOFEX and the 50 years of WOFEX, because 1974, 2024, uh, Prof. Boyx Ocha, we are now celebrating 50th year of WOFEX this year. So it's a big, <laughs> big, big uh, timeline and big achievement for us. But what happened in the last 50 years? A lot of things have changed. A lot of improvements came in in the management of uh, congenital malformations. One of them is in uh, diaphragmatic hernia. In the early years, it was regarded as a surgical emergency. In other words, you diagnose a patient with diaphragmatic hernia and rush the patient to theater. Diaphragmatic hernia, is, as we've discussed, it's a, it's a defect in the, in the diaphragm and the intestines are moved into the chest. And the belief was that the earlier you remove that uh, pressure from the lungs, uh, the the better the outcomes would be. That was the that was the thinking. But what what research has shown, and then it became also a clinical practice, is that it's not actually that uh, intestine pressing pressurizing or putting pressure on the uh, lungs. It's how much the lung is developed determines the outcome whether the baby is going to survive or not. That's why Prof. Salim mentioned that it is a medical uh, emergency and uh, it, and that's why that initial care of the baby is very important and then the surgery can be done uh, later uh, done some days down the line so that care um is also something that may be needed uh, during transport too um so because they may not have enough uh, lung capacity to survive um the baby if it is what one can also cause a natural selection if your baby is done reasonably well and uh, being able to maintain the uh, what we would call saturation or doesn't turn that blue and so on then may survive the transport with a bit of oxygen but uh, there's that group and it's it's not a small group where there's just not possible capacity to sustain the life themselves that group will require of course an intubation and ventilation and not at the hospital where they will go to, it it needs to happen on site where they are found, where they are seen originally. So, so transport, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, just to summarize that, uh, the gen general care is taken for the neonates transport, but for diaphragmatic hernia, if there are facilities available to intubate, ventilate, and transport, that's obviously uh, um, that's obviously Thank what you. is required. Yeah. What about an orogastric tube? Like in our situations when they do yeah. not have facility for intubation and you get a call that such a baby is delivered in a village, what to do, turning blue. So we advise you at least put a nasogastric tube and take out the air because the baby is crying and the stomach is getting full and that is leading to further decompression of the lung with a mediastinal shift. That also helps, of course, yes. It won't change the... Uh, um, the, the it won't... It, it won't help with won't help the much, maturation but... of the lung, but mm -hmm. you want to make sure that the stomach Prevented. is decompressed and stomach is not uh, dilated uh, during transport. And for sure, it will definitely help the baby. And for those where it has reached the neonatal surgery, it's a good idea to put at least 5 ml or 10 ml of air in the nasogastric tube before taking an X-ray to confirm the diagnosis if that is the basis of diagnosis. Uh, Professor Ochoa, you wanted to say something before we move on to advances? Yes. Uh, so when, when I began my specialty in the 60s, I, I, I did it in Germany. And that in this time, the two big hospitals in Germany were Bremen, where I was, and Munich. And, Munich. and they operated, and we operated the diaphragmatic area by thoracotomy, and that, with the time, demonstrated that it's a big, big, big mistake. Why? Because the problem is that the lung, the, the whole thing is a whole, a whole malformation. 
not only the diaphragmatic hernia, the lung is also malformated. The lung is already, already touched. And the same thing happens, and I have demonstrated a little bit in the other side. And that is normally the problem. If you do, if you do by just by just by abdominal, by abdominal, by abdominal approach, then the most important thing is what you have brought down all the intestine, then you have to be very careful to redo the gastroesophageal angle. If not, in the post-operative, you have gastroesophageal reflux. Then you have to do everything that you can to put again the, 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 the making, making the gastroesophageal angle to, to eliminate the gastroesophageal reflux, that is the problem later. And that is the thing that we have to say to every pediatric surgeon that if it is very important to, re, re, to redo the gastroesophageal angle. What do you think? So normally the defect is on the lateral side, it, only if it is a very big defect that we will be able to see the gastroesophageal angle and the left lobe of the liver is coming in between. Yeah, yeah. Usually, though we know we should do that, but usually in our practice, we don't go searching under the uh, liver to look for the gastroesophageal angle. We just try and put the stomach down as much as we can. What do you say, Professor Al? Um, I mean, I, I agree with you. I, I raised my hand to to highlight another um, area with the diaphragmatic hernias. Um, so, if, with your permission, if I if I may yeah, just sure. maybe sure. divert a little bit uh, from what has been discussed now. So, um, we we being a global organization as WOFEPS, um, we're very much aware of uh, very different circumstances in different parts of the world, and every country, every region, every hospital they develop their own way of uh, best managing the conditions within the resources available. But because we're talking about pediatric surgery and we also want to highlight what has been achieved in pediatric surgery, and perhaps there may be young colleagues who are thinking of a specialty and they're looking at uh, these conversations as a potential um, um, aspiration for themselves, whether they will move into pediatric surgery or not. The, the, the advancements have been such wonderful in the last 50 years. We are able to see one of them in this uh, condition of diaphragmatic hernia where fetal surgery has been brought in. Um, it's not uh, available everywhere. It's in fact available in very few centers, of course, but uh, it's just to indicate how much pediatric surgery has developed to a point that uh, they can actually intervene during the fetal life when the diagnosis is made and uh, we mentioned that the lung capacity and, and the lung maturity is important in this condition. Helped it, helped it help the lungs to grow and, uh, and, uh, and function better when the baby is born. But that uh, um, intervention takes place during fetal life. So um, mm. as I said, there are very few centers obviously offering this, but uh, it's again a wonderful, uh, wonderful representation of how much pediatric surgery has uh, advanced in the last uh, 50 years. Thank you. Thank you. So for the layman, uh, now a balloon can be put into the trachea while the baby is still in the mother's womb with a small endoscope around 2.5 millimeters, that much small. So they can go inside, put in a balloon, and that balloon does not does al uh, allow the fluid, it allows the fluid to remain in the lung. It doesn't go out. So with that fluid, the lung expands and pushes the contents with the, which are in the chest down. So the lung is able to grow and the contents are reduced. Just before delivery, the balloon is either punctured or allowed to be taken out when the baby is born and he just swallows it out. So, uh, Professor Ochoa, what do you think? Uh, is this the way to go? Will this be the future that all babies will be diagnosed during the antenatal period with an ultrasound and many of them will be subjected to this fetal surgery? Or is it still time to wait because we know that there may be some anesthetic effects on the baby which is within the mother's womb during anesthesia to the mother? 
no, normally, until now, oh, in my time, all, almost all the babies were diagnosed after the delivery, but not before. I don't have any experience about doing minimal invasive surgery. I have experience doing the balloon afterwards. It was very good, but not very much time, only preparing the child to operate. And that was in this time. Now with the balloon and with the, and you can do that also when the newborn is in the womb of his mother. In my time, that was impossible. And that was like a dream, mm -hmm. nothing more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So if the baby is born and there is an antenatal diagnosis, would you like the mother to be shifted to a center that is in utero transport to a center where there is a pediatric surgeon and the facilities are available? Professor yes. Al, Professor Uchwa? Yes, absolutely. Yes, sure. absolutely. Yeah. Professor Salim? Yes, uh, this should be. Uh, uh, in our <clears throat> few years back, we were working on this. We want to set up a uh, establish a setup in the children's hospital or like this, where the these complicated um, uh, patients having the congenital anomalies prenatally diagnosed should be shifted to the center. But still, it is a dream. We worked on it, but we were unable to make such a center in Pakistan. Although uh, uh, it, one thing is a uh, issue when there are children hospitals, they are usually isolated children hospitals in our part of the world. They are not attached with the other uh, setup where the gy uh, gynae or obstetric facilities are available. In these children, uh, uh, one concept was presented in uh, our part of the world, mother and child hospital. That is a, actually a dream where the uh, uh, delivery is done in the same setting where uh, surgical facilities are available. Now it, it is on the way, uh, this should be. The otherwise, uh, uh, is, uh, a, a setup should be established where at least complicated uh, uh, patients should be shifted with the prenatally diagnosed uh, such sort of conditions. And afterwards, they should be shifted to neonatal setup where they are resuscitated and afterwards seen by pediatric surgeons and operated in time. Thank you this so much. So another, another congenital condition in which we will advise in utero transfer of the baby is when the intestines are lying outside the abdomen through a small opening, a condition known as gastroschisis. Professor Alp, would you please describe what is gastroschisis? Yeah, as you have uh, mentioned, um, it's a, it's a um, interesting condition in a sense because uh, the babies are born with a hole with a defect in the anterior abdominal wall just next to the uh, belly button area the, the cord the umbilical cord and through that hole you see the intestines uh, protruding through and uh, in the uh, warm in the fetal life they obviously inside that uh, um, water amniotic fluid and, uh, and then the intestines are outside so with delivery uh, this may be diagnosed, or as we mentioned, uh, if there's an opportunity to do ultrasound examination beforehand, it can also be picked up uh, prior to uh, the delivery itself. So that's what is gastroschisis, and uh, there are a few conditions that are very similar. Um, there is another condition where the intestines also appears to be outside, but they're covered with a membrane. And the uh, gastroschisis is the one where there is no um, membrane. Um, so what, what we're discussing now is, of course, these are um, the index pediatric surgical conditions um, that affects the neonates. And uh, there are a number of them and uh, um, we, where our specialty deals and, uh, uh, and this is one of them. And Another condition. Be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and if it's picked up uh, earlier, again, it's it's wonderful if a pediatric surgeon is informed. If it's picked up earlier, I mean when uh, uh, when the when the baby before the baby is born, and an ultrasound is done, a so-called antenatal ultrasound, and they and it would be best for them to be seen by a pediatric surgeon 
so that it, the, the whole condition is explained to the parents. Uh, it's something that we also call antenatal counseling and uh, what to expect because it's such a big shock for the parents to hear um, initially. But it's a condition that's uh, treatable and the uh, um, patients, uh, if it is managed properly, they, they have a, a wonderful life afterwards uh, with, with good prognosis, as we would say. And uh, um, and it's seen, being seen by a pediatric surgeon is, 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 is one of the first steps that should take place before the delivery. Yeah. So the take-home message from here is that antenatal scans should be done. While the prognosis is very good in the developed part of the world, the developing world is still struggling with a lot of mortality because these cases are undiagnosed. Very few are diagnosed during the antenatal period, roughly around only 10%. And those that are diagnosed during the antenatal period do make it with 80 to 90% survival, whereas those that are not diagnosed and do not reach the hospital well in time, because when the intestine is outside, it gets bloated up, it sticks together, and then it becomes very difficult to put inside, and a bag has to be created, and that bag leads can lead to infection and sepsis. So then the life becomes difficult. With that, we we'll move to another condition known as posterior urethral valve. So, Professor Ochoa, would you like to describe this condition, which also can be picked up during the antenatal period and can also have some intervention done in fetal life? How are they picked up? The, gastro, the problem with the gastrochysis is how long has been outside the abdomen in before the delivery. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the problem is not the operation. The operation is very easy. The diagnosis is very easy. And the problem is which possibility has some countries to send this immediately to a hospital. But the, I think the most important thing for us and for the prognosis is how long has been the intestine outside the abdomen in the womb of in the uterus? Because if he has been a long time, he has been, you see that the whole wall, intestine wall, is damaged, is augmented, and then after the operation, you can have a very long paralytic ileus. And that is a problem, a big problem, not only this, but also with the adherence that sometimes you have it. That is my experience about it. Once operated, if the gastrochysis has been very near the delivery, it's not a problem. And how Alp has said, the prognosis is very easy, the diagnosis is very easy, and the postoperatory it's very good for the children. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what about posterior urethral valves? Excuse me? Posterior urethral valve condition. Oh. I think it's okay. <laughs> Professor Salim? A posterior urethral valve is a condition in which there is a distal obstruction to the urinary outflow uh, 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 after the bladder. Uh, for the layman purpose, when uh, uh, it, there is the obstruction, it creates a backflow pressure effect. Bladder will be distended and along with bladder, there will be uh, hydro-urethronephrosis and there will be, uh, it will uh, <clears throat> affect the all of the uh, kidney, ureter, bladder, all of the systems and ultimately leads to the uh, kidney failure. So, so uh, we discussed uh, uh, we, yeah. we discussed a little bit about it yesterday also. So today we want to move to the antenatal part of it. So would you recommend? Well, I'm going, I, I am going towards the antenatal part. No, it is uh, uh, something uh, is good that majority of the uh, gynecologists they do ultrasonology themselves, and of, along with that, in the radiological setup, the most of the ultrasonologists they do the uh, ultrasonology, and nowadays. Uh, 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 technicians are trained in the radiological setup. They are all able to the, do the ultrasound. And they are uh, also taught about the prenatal uh, congenital conditions, about these things. Uh, usually in the cities uh, cities and uh, small cities, 
uh, these facilities are available in our part of the world also, although it is a very uh, good way available in the developed part of the countries. If they are diagnosed prenatally, then uh, this patient uh, should be taken into account and they should be, these are the candidates who should be shifted towards the centers where early pediatric surgical or pediatric urological uh, facilities are available. After birth, uh, if they are diagnosed prenatally, uh, if there is a severe disease, uh, intrauterine intervention can be planned in these cases by uh, some uh, putting some sort of uh, evacuation from the bladder for the layman uh, purpose. But uh, usually these are not available in our part of the world. Intra uh, fetal intervention is not available in our part of the world. So these patients should be early shifted towards the center where the uh, pediatric surgical facilities are available or uh, pediatric urological facilities, nor they are also on the way they are available. Immediately after birth, these patients should be in uh, uh, an, an NG number four or six should be passed per urethra to decompress the bladder. And, after, uh, and uh, this patient should be, uh, likewise, we have already discussed, they should be managed for hypovolemia, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, everything. They should be corrected up and they should be maintained in the nursery. Uh, they should uh, provide the free drainage. It is easy to pass uh, NG in case of posterior valves. And it, its direction is upward, so NG can easily negotiate and they can be decompressed. Afterwards, uh, uh, taking into account uh, uh, their function, renal function should be assessed. Ultrasonology postnatally uh, should be done. Uh, it should be uh, picked up how much hydronephrosis is there, what is the condition of the bladder, and uh, if uh, and after and blood investigation like blood complete, uh, urea, creatinine, serum electrolytes, they should be done, and uh, patient condition should be assessed, uh, <clears throat> and a free drainage should be allowed. Uh, it is. Uh, I, I. I will say that this is also not a, 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 a more urgent surgical em, uh, uh, emergency. But first, the patient should be resuscitated because if the patient is delayed, referred, offered after the birth, they can uh, suffer from the acidosis. They are dehydrated. They are uh, having the acidotic uh, uh, respiratory acidosis, and they have a lot of problems. They should be first resuscitated, and then. Uh, uh, but the basic thing is to pass NG per urethra to decompress the bladders. Then they should be subjected for surgical interventions. Thank you so much. So we've discussed quite a lot of congenital anomalies. Pediatric surgeons also deal with other conditions, surgical conditions, which the baby may get throughout his life up to the age of 18 or even 21 years in some countries. Uh, so, Professor Alp, would you like to describe what are the lung infections like uh, pus in the chest? How do they present and what should be uh, the treatment for that? Um, yeah, I think uh, the infection, when we hear about the infection, the, the main thing that comes to one's mind is the uh, temperature raise. So um, that's that's number one. And when children have raised temperature, there are certain sort of uh, areas in the body that uh, we need to check if this infection is coming from, from those areas or not. And pediatricians are very good with that, and they would say, you know, check the ears, check the urine, and then, of course, uh, the lungs is, uh, the chest infections is another big uh, component of uh, diseases that can cause uh, raised temperatures. So that's how the patient will present with potentially cough, uh, being not able to breathe well or, or breathing very fast and the high temperature. And that's how the patient would uh, present. Investigations at the end in a, in a medical setup setting will then determine that the patient might have a, a pus collection outside the lungs in the pleural cavity, what we would call it, uh, outside the lung and under the chest wall. And, uh, and then there are um, ways to manage this. And, uh, and again, they're not difficult to manage and they are, they're well managed in, uh, in a setup where the children are treated surgically. Um, but obviously the, the setup requires all the uh, radiology and the uh, expertise for these. So I think from the from the public point of view, um, any infection is important. Um, and there are many infections that are um, very simple 
and his children grow, they come and go, and uh, and they uh, um, there's often small viral infections that uh, they would cause very similar symptoms to some of the diseases that uh, are more um, important in a sense. Um, so if it is something that's out of the ordinary, uh, outside that simple viral uh, sore throat type of thing, uh, perhaps the, the best advice one can give is to seek uh, medical uh, attention, and which may lead to something that we've just discussed, a, a significant issue with an infection with a pus collection in the chest. Uh, but again, the uh, hopefully the health systems. And one of the things that WOFEPS is trying to achieve is to make sure that there is health systems improving in every part of the world and uh, with collaboration between colleagues. And hopefully with, the, uh, with these improved health systems in place, uh, these conditions are picked up early and referred for treatment. Thank you. So if a child is at home and having upper respiratory tract infection, high grade fever, how many days should he remain at home or after how many days of illness should it be a concern to show a doctor and then get a chest x-ray? Because as pediatric surgeons, we are referred these patients from the pediatricians who does an x-ray chest. So for the public, what would be the message after how many days of infection or high grade fever should they visit the doctor for more investigations? So, so um, we we had a lot of conversations with uh, with mothers and our nursing colleagues and so on. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've been advised, and I I feel that is the that is one of the best advices that I have had myself. They said if the mother is concerned about the child, mm -hmm. then uh, there is a reason for the child to be seen by a medical practitioner by a nursing team member or by a pediatrician or by a general practitioner. Um, but if the mom says, my child is not all right and I'm concerned about it, that's good enough reason for uh, um, a medical person to see the child. Um, usually after a day or two, things need to settle down. Um, but if it is not settling down, it's 48 hours, you still have a high temperature and uh, there's still uh, very rapid breathing then uh, um, it, then that's sort of a time period that one should say, you must go to the uh, medical facility now. Um, it, it often, simple viral infections, if they're causing the temperature, they would be settling down within that first uh, 48 hours. Thank you. So with infection in the chest, there may be another condition in which there is pus collection in the liver. And this is known as liver abscess, which we see quite a lot in developing countries. The cause may be something like not having a good hygiene or not doing proper hand washing and leading to amoebiasis or even pyogenic liver abscess. So, Professor Salim, how common is this liver abscess in your country? Uh, it is uh, not very much common, although we have seen uh, many cases in our uh, hospital uh, nowadays, uh, one thing is that the gastroenterologist, pediatric gastroenterologist, they are also involved in uh, management of liver abscesses. Uh, the patients, as you have highlighted, who uh, are not uh, uh, pro proper hygiene is not maintained, their nutrition is not pro up to mark, it is infected, or there is a, some sort of a GIT infection, then it travels to the liver and it, uh, it is caught up in the liver and it leads to the pyogenic liver abscess formation. Uh, these sort of the patient, if there is a fever to the patient, patient is uncomfortable, have a pain on the right side, especially in the right upper uh, abdomen and uh, right upper, uh, right hypochondrium or upper abdomen or, uh, and has a fever, these patients should be investigated. These patients should, uh, uh, nowadays ultrasound is very common. Every person asks, sir, may I need uh, to do the ultrasound? So these are the patients where ultrasound should be done early. And if there is a liver abscess, it should be treated properly by the pediatric uh, surgeon or pediatric gastroenterologist. And the, in the early uh, part of the disease, they can be easily managed with the antibiotics, proper antibiotics, and if needed, by ultrasound-guided aspiration. Uh, nowadays, surgery was very common a uh, uh, few years back, but nowadays surgery is uh, not uh, an option. A repeated ultrasound aspiration leads to resolution of the symptom. 
and if needed if complicated then surgical option should be thought of so the take home message is here is do not delay early diagnosis and treatment because we have seen cases in which this liver abscess may even burst open and even lead to empyema formation the condition that professor alp has said professor ochua we would like to ask you about worm infestation do you still have that in south america and north america in north america you have very few mm -hmm. infections but in south america is very often is very often because the nurses the nurses they they are few that they are high classified and they they what you say washing the hands having with 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 the, the that is that is in south america is much 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 frequent than in north america and in europe is also very unfrequent in europe is very unfrequent that is in Europe, liver abscesses is almost unknown. Mm -hmm. well, that is very good to know. So in our country, deworming program is being run by the government where we give these deworming tablets, that is albendazole, to school children, which they have in front of us, and we monitor them for any symptoms which if they develop any side effects. Professor Alp, how is the condition in South Africa? Do you get worm infestations like ascariasis, long worms or pinworms? Yeah, I think the, the sort of short answer is yes, we do get it. Um, but uh, it's certainly uh, decreasing in numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, 20, 30 years ago, we had uh, more cases coming through. And uh, it is uh, much better now. And as you said, it's the, I would call this the public health side of pediatric surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, because we, as pediatric surgeons, have been dealing with um, really very, very significant conditions that what one considers as a simple worm might uh, have uh, resulted in. As you've said, from liver issues to intestinal issues and, uh, and, and many other conditions that become so complex. And if you look at it, at the basis of it, they have uh, either an obstruction from the worms or it's a uh, um, twisting of the bowel that uh, we have seen many of them uh, due to the worms, the uh, gallbladder and the bowel duct issues. Uh, worms can travel to many interesting places and cause trouble, and then the uh, liver abscesses and so on as well. So, so overall they are decreasing, and uh, and that deworming programs are working um, very well. Um, but again, we we are a, we are still seeing them occasionally. Another problem seen in our part of the world is hydrated cysts, which can happen with pet dogs and stray dogs. Do you have that that common? And do you think we need to have some medications yes. to prevent that as well? Yes, hydrated cyst is also common. So that's a condition where a little parasite causes and uh, um, it has uh, a life uh, that uh, takes uh, the parasite uh, between the human, but also the sheep and the dogs and so on. And that's uh, um, something that uh, results in a disease in, again, many parts of the body, sometimes in the lungs, sometimes in the liver, sometimes in a lesser degree, but in organs like pancreas, and even the brain, and so on. So uh, we are still seeing that. And uh, it, 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 in South Africa, um, there is one region where um, these patients mostly come from, and that's where the farming community is, and uh, um, and that's where most of our patients come from. Um, so the again, the techniques have developed to treat these patients. The outcomes are very good, um, and uh, and as uh, the development of uh, management uh, happens, then the invasiveness of surgery also decreases. So, in the past, where a, maybe a major operation would be needed. Uh, but today we are able to treat these patients with uh, fairly simple, sometimes just with an aspiration and injection of medication into it. So uh, that's also um, a, a big achievement, big development that we had in our field. That's wonderful. So with infective causes, we now move on to appendicitis. Professor Salim, can you describe about appendicitis, which people common man knows about, when should it be a concern? How should the parents think that maybe my child has appendicitis? 
uh, usually the general community is well aware, well aware of appendicitis, word appendicitis, as uh, few words are very commonly usually used, uh, commonly known. Appendicitis, pneumonia, these are the common words where they uh, themselves suspect these things. Whenever there is a pain in the abdomen, starting in the periumbilical or epigastrium, then shifting towards the right iliac fossa, it should be suspected that this may be a, a case of appendicitis. Uh, usually, it takes few hours to settle in the right iliac fossa, pain, uh, for the pain to settle in the right iliac fossa. These patients should be suspected and referred to a setting where they can be properly diagnosed and treated early. Uh, the, uh, at least these patients uh, should be examined by the pediatrician, general practitioner, and then referred to pediatric surgeon and evaluated properly. Uh, at, uh, in these cases, uh, complete history, as I have described, starting pain from epigastrium and oblique region, settling towards the right ring fossa, this should be taken and a, a typical, uh, a proper uh, physical examination should be done. Uh, that is, uh, uh, should be evaluated for tenderness and especially more marked on the right iliac fossa and rebound tenderness. Uh, for the layman, if it is a abdomen is pressed in the right side, it, there is a pain, it is a tenderness. And when we leave it and then a more uh, pain, then it is a rebound tenderness. And if these are positive along with the history, it is a near 80% case of appendicitis, although there may be some other causes which can make uh, appendicitis. Then uh, co a blood complete should be done and seen whether uh, WBC count is raised or not, and uh, what about the neutrophils and lymphocytes, neutrophils are raised or, or not. And uh, uh, nowadays, uh, it can also be, uh, uh, your diagnosis can be augmented with the help of ultrasound. And now ultrasound, ultrasonologists are well uh, trained they can uh, help us by seeing the uh, appendix, whether its lumen is increased or not. There is a inflammation on this side. There is a ileus on in the right iliac fossa, or there is a few uh, lymph nodes enlarged, or there is a some. Uh, if it is advanced, there may be a mass formation. They can help you a lot in this case. And these cases should be uh, early diagnosed and early surgical intervention should be done in these cases. So there is a sea change in appendicitis and there's a management change also. In our part of the world, we still prescribe antibiotics and some of them get treated with only antibiotics and then we do interval appendicectomy. That also, if needed, many children get away with one episode of appendicitis and never require appendicectomy. On the other hand, in UK, the first indication, if you think of, about appendicitis, you're not supposed to prescribe any antibiotic. You're supposed to confirm your diagnosis and take the child to theater. How is the condition in South Afri Ameri Africa and then South America from Professor Ochoa? So, so the oh, mainstay yeah. of treatment in uh, appendicitis for us is still surgical. Still so that's, surgical. that's number one. Mm -hmm. But having said that, it's again one of those developments that we're having in the field of pediatric surgery. Um, the use of antibiotics and not the use of surgery under controlled conditions is also uh, taking place. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of selecting the right patient for the right uh, treatment. And I think... Um, so we don't have one treatment option for all anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And it's certainly increasing in numbers, the treatment of appendicitis without uh, surgery. Uh, but it needs to be done by um, colleagues, by uh, surgeons, uh, pediatric surgeons or surgeons who used to treat children with uh, surgical diseases and in a controlled environment. Yeah. Thank you. Professor Ocho, how is the condition in North America and South America? I'm asking you for both continents. I can about North America, the appendicitis, they do appendicectomy the most. Why? The same thing in Europe. In Europe, now in the Northern Europe, the Northern countries like Finland, like Sweden, like Norway, and like Denmark, they are treating now more and more with antibiotics. But the insurance companies, that is a problem now financial. The insurance companies are paying the pediatric surgeons much more money if they operated as they do antibiotics. Why? By appendicectomy in three days, 
the child is at home by antibiotic you need five, six, seven days. And that costs a lot of money from daily at the hospital. Therefore, the insurance companies are paying the doctors, the pediatric surgeons, we pay you more if you do a, pay, a rapid insectomy than you do antibiotic. And that is now a great war. Also, the, the pediatric surgeons, sometimes they convince the mother, what do you want? In two days, you have the child at home with a small appendicitis, operation that is surgery that is nothing, or six days at the hospital. There are mothers that they are, they don't want surgery. And there are mothers that say, oh, better in three days and I have the appendicitis the appendicitis away. In South America, almost everything is with appendicectomy. And in North America also, and in North America also, the, uh, the stay at the hospital is very, very, very high. And an appendicectomy financially is better than a, by antibiotic. This war that is only financially, we will see what will be in 10 years. And also, as Alp has said, the, with the appendicectomy, you take the appendix out, you don't have any problem. But if you choose the antibiotic, you have to choose the right treatment at this moment. And if you don't choose very well, you can, I don't know how long can you stay giving him antibiotic at the hospital and with good results. That is, at the moment, it's a very big question. So in our part of the world, if the child has appendicitis, they may be seen by a pediatrician also, or a pediatric surgeon, and we can prescribe them oral antibiotics also, which they can take at home, and the cost will be just less than $10, or maybe $5, maybe less than that also. So they can be treated with that. If the condition gets severe, we tell them if there is a problem, you have to come back to hospital and the high flag, red flag signs are told to them, high grade fever, or if there is nausea and vomiting, because once the child has vomiting, then he cannot be made to stay at home. But good antibiotics are available and that has been the general practice now to prescribe oral antibiotics for appendicitis, unless it is really severe and the child comes running to the hospital in emergency situation. How is the condition in Pakistan, Professor Salim? In Pakistan, usually uh, as uh, Elp and Bas Ochoa has highlighted, the first uh, treatment for the appendicitis is uh, surgical, if it is diagnosed or suspected. But I will use the one of the term that is supervised neglect. It means uh, this was done in the, uh, this is usually used, uh, this term is used in Parthi's disease. Uh, supervised neglect means if you start with antibiotic, you should monitor the patients. Patient should be in your reach. Either it should be in the hospital or in if is, he is at home or uh, residence is nearby, he should visit you again in the morning, next morning. He should be in your supervision. Reevaluate on the uh, next, uh, next day and if his uh, symptoms are improving, you can wait and continue with antibiotic. And if his symptoms are not improving, then admit him and proceed for the appendicectomy. Sometimes I opt this. If the I, I start, so, so many times the patient's attendant do not accept the operative treatment. Then we start with the antibiotic and uh, monitor the patient and ask them to visit on the next time, uh, next day for evaluation. Uh, although uh, uh, it is uh, used many times in Pakistan, but it is not routinely practiced. Routine practice is that the two, uh, whichever patient is diagnosed as appendicitis, it should be operated until and unless he is improve, on the improving side. For the severe cases with the advent of laparoscopy, previously the Oshner-Sharon regime used to be used quite often. But with laparoscopy, we have started going in, in lumps and taking out the appendix when it is inflamed. Has the scenario changed, Professor Alp, in South Africa? Suppose oh, yes, the lump sure. Use of laparoscopy has been uh, brought in big time. And we've even done studies about this and published them. And uh, from, from about 2010 or so, 
uh, laparoscopy has become the uh, um, the main sort of uh, modality. When we say laparoscopy, again, for the public, it's the keyhole surgery. So we do the operation through five millimeter holes uh, in the abdominal wall. And uh, usually about uh, three little holes or sometimes four is needed. And you can do the entire operation by looking at the uh, camera and using special instruments and special um, equipment. Um, and and the benefits of laparoscopy is that they go um, back to full feeds uh, after the operation in a shorter period of time, and the patients uh, are discharged home in shorter uh, period of time. And uh, we, we majority of the appendicectomies, uh, majority of the operations for appendicitis now um, in our centers are done, at least in our center that I've worked, uh, is done using laparoscopy with very good results. Thank you so much for that. So with laparoscopy, that is keyhole surgery, a scope is put inside the abdomen and even a search for any small particle of pus can be made and a wash can be done. So better surgery can be done with laparoscopy under magnified vision. So we are able to see the abdomen on a screen in a magnified view. We would now like to talk about torsion testes and that will be the last topic for today. Uh, Professor Ochoa, would you like to talk about it? What? Excuse me? Torsion testicle, torsion testes. About torsion testicle, that is that that is such pain that the mother brings up immediately the children to the hospital. Then they are diagnosed there and operated, and that is they are upset. The most important thing is the mother. The child had such pain that they bring so immediately the child to the hospital, the operation, the diagnosis is there, and the operation is immediately done. Then how long has been? He can he can survive, or then you have to extirpate and put it in, and later to put a, an, another one. But the torsion, the testicle torsion. In spite that you operate on time, that the, also 80% becomes infertility. And that has been by function seeing the spermatozoids are completely, completely worthless, no good. While giving public lectures, Torsion testes is one thing which I realize the public does not know about at all. Even the media, even the grown-ups, if the mother does not know, the father does not know, how will they diagnose that such a serious condition can occur in the child? So I have been trying to tell school children that if you have pain anywhere in the body, do not sit, keep sitting in the class. Tell your class teacher and you may have a condition in which, you, in which you may need to be rushed to the hospital. So till date, even today, we had a news media program and none of them knew about testicular torsion and they didn't want to talk about it. They felt it's... Uh, stigma to talk about uh, such a condition. How is the condition in Pakistan? Do, are the people aware about it? Uh, very few. I have uh, operated few cases in the last few months. They came to me after four or five days when the testes are already uh, gone. Uh, Pak uh, Pakistani people uh, uh, are like uh, are the same like uh, in India. They are not aware of the conditions and they usually ignore the condition. Uh, our GPs and our uh, they also give the painkillers and say uh, ask them to come on the next day. Uh, uh, these are the uh, early part of the <clears throat> disease entity is very much important as testes uh, 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 its vascularity can compromise with the passage of time. Within 24 hours, early intervention can give uh, better results, and it also depends upon the number of uh, terms. Uh, uh, 360 degrees, 720 degrees, how much turns. Uh, if there are more number of turns, then the testes will be lost uh, in uh, in just few hours. Yeah, so, so within six uh, hours. Um, in, yeah, very, very. It is a very, very painful, as uh, Basa Chua said. Uh, 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 we should, uh, key, uh, we should uh, move for the awareness of the, our community that if there is a uh, pain in the balls or lower part of the abdomen, 
and uh, it is so severe and it is referred into the uh, from lower part to the abdomen then it may be a case of torsion of testes if pain start with the trauma or with the uh, playing or in the last part of the night when there is a retention of urine uh, is uh, if there is such sort of history these patients should be evaluated by the pediatric surgeons they should consult it and early uh, ultrasonology or color doppler should be performed and if there is a suspicion of torsion of testes you are not able to rule it out then i think uh, exploration is better we should not ignore in this so when taking such a child to the hospital the parents should be mentally prepared that the child may need an urgent surgery during the first visit to the hospital uh, professor alp would you like to add some comments on torsion testes and then i would request you to please wind up the session today thanks very much so, i mean i fully agree with my colleagues as well of course the painful swollen scrotum you know, as far as we are concerned it's a surgical emergency and uh, a, a pediatric surgeon needs to see and it, and it is a difficult condition for i can imagine a child to come up with and and explain or tell the parents or may feel shy about that and i think doing work in schools and uh, and public to let children know that anything that uh, that they're unhappy with in terms of pain, they need to seek uh, medical advice. And the outcome is, uh, you know, it may not be torsion as well, and it may be something very simple, um, but may still require surgery. So I think from that perspective, uh, it is very important. Um, so as a, as a closure, words, uh, thanks so much again, at, firstly to Professor Sharma for uh, setting this up and uh, and to my colleagues, uh, Professor Boix Ocho and Professor Salim, it's wonderful to again uh, meet up from many different parts of the world and uh, be able to discuss these conditions in a format that uh, we um, hope the public will engage with and uh, will interact with. And uh, and we love to hear more from them. Um, we are not used to um, creating YouTube videos. But one thing I hear um, when I watch your YouTube videos is they say, remember to uh, subscribe, remember to remember to like and make comments. We'd love to see the comments coming through. And uh, through those comments, we will be able to, of course, uh, re-sort of uh, structure the format of uh, these talks. And uh, would love to have colleagues joining us from other parts of the world too to, uh, to attend to these meetings. Um, Shilpa. Yeah, so Professor Alp has made a very nice uh, movie on appendicitis and I would request him if we can put that link in uh, below in the YouTube link for this. Yes, absolutely. That's that's actually a storyline where um, we, we've uh, got a child who had appendicectomy playing, acting in a movie. Um, is a patient coming in with uh, abdominal pain and uh, it's RNA Health uh, movie with four parts. Uh, it's all staged. It's it's uh, based on a scenario, uh, but it is a medical education uh, video, but it was also very good for parents to see too. Um, you're more than welcome to, to share it, uh, Shilpa. Thank you so much. So with that, I thank Professor Alp, the president of the VOFAPS, Professor Boy Ochoa, the well-known figure who has started the VOFAPS and he has been around for 50 years now. Thank you so much for the support that you give to the association and bring it up. Lots of thanks to Professor Salim for representing Pakistan and Australasia in general. You have been a big support and telling us about things happening on that part of the world. Thank you all, dear viewers. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank would, you. I want to thank and to congratulate Alp and Shilpa what they are doing now with WOFAPS. You have begun bringing WOFAP forwards, forwards, WOFAPS. It is a new cycle. I have dedicated a part of my life to WOFAPS, but I am so happy to see that WOFAPS is so strong, so strength. And that is thanks to you both with the idea that you have brought with the webinars, with the seven, with the with the pediatric surgery day, with everything that you have done and you are doing is also marvelous. And I can say from my point of view, that has been a part of my life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
uh, and you are doing an excellent work and you have begun a completely new cycle of WOFAPs. Thank you. Thank you. They have the credit of introducing World Pediatric Surgery Day. It is a big achievement. This time in Pakistan, it is celebrated on wider scale in Lahore, Ralpindi, and Karachi. Uh, walks were done, and there was a session on the pediatric surgery, and there were writing in the newspaper and on the TV, multi, uh, um, on the TVs. Uh, uh, I, I gave them the credit that they have uh, make it uh, practical, make it possible to celebrate this day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. With that, we end this session. Thank you, everybody.